thank you for the for the introduction and for the invitation to speak here. Um, I'm very happy to to present here because after all these years of being part of the community, as Sudat said, I started being one of the co-chairs of 3D Sig. So I'm I'm starting to take care of of the content of this space, and I hope uh, I can find collaborators during this path. But today I'm coming here to speak uh, about uh, science. So I'm going to talk about uh, local energetic frustration, which is a, a concept derived from the protein folding uh, energy landscapes theory and how it is related to protein families, identities and superfamilies, and how can we use it as a proxy to understand protein evolution, dynamics and function. So the thing with proteins is that proteins are um, natural micro, micro nano machines, but they, they need to fold, but they are not optimized only to fold, but also to function. And many times folding and function are in conflict with each other. So as I mentioned, the frustration concept derives from the energy landscapes theory in which it says that proteins are very specific systems. They are evolved systems that have minimized the conflicts in the native states, which is known also as the minimum frustration principle. However, whenever you look at this picture here as an energy, an energy landscape, and here in the bottom you have the, the native structure of the protein, you can always look at the protein that it's folded and find that in some regions there are still some residues that are in conflict or they are highly frustrated with the local environment. And the thing is that these conflicts may have been positively selected by evolution. And the reason why we find them there is because of functional reasons. So the most um, easier to understand explanation for this, for example, is that actually if you zoom in here in the native state of the protein, this is not a single molecule, a single structure, but a, 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 a set of structures, an ensemble of, of conformers that exist in a dynamic equilibrium. And it is local frustration, these conflicts that allow the protein to transition in between the different conformers with the given dynamics. So very rapidly uh, in 2007, uh, my, my PhD supervisor, together with Peter Wallins, they developed an algorithm to try to find and localize and quantify local frustration in protein structures. So the algorithm roughly works like this. If you have a protein structure, you can get an energy function and you can calculate which is the energy of interaction between two residues I and J. And then once you measure this native energy with your energy functions, you can create decoys or alternative conformations by uh, mutate, mutating the identity of the residues or changing the conformation, the local conformation. So every time you do a, a decoy, you create a decoy, you can measure this energy again, and then you will have a distribution of energies in the decoys where you are going to be able to put your native energy and to compare the native energy against the mean value of this distribution. So basically, the the, the the logics goes like this. If the native energy is way more negative than the mean energy of random conformations that you can make, it means that your energy is not optimized. So your your, your energy, uh, it's, uh, sorry, it was optimized. So if the energy is worse, it means that your energy is minimally frustrated. In the other case, it means that most of the distribution will have a better energy. And in that case, it means that your native energy is not optimized and therefore is highly frustrated. It doesn't really matter much. You can check all the details in this publication here from quite a few years ago. But basically, we have facilitated this for you. We have created some years ago a web server and also an R package more recently, where you can just get your protein structure, you put it in here, and in two clicks, you can get the frustration patterns on top of your structure. So the results will look like this. Uh, frustration can be calculated at the level of contacts. Here, the green lines are things that are good for energy, the red lines are bad for energy, and the same you can do at the level of single residues. So one residue can be assigned at different colors. So basically, again, what the only thing you have to keep in mind for the rest of my presentation is that given a protein, we can calculate frustration at the level of residues or contacts. Whenever we do that, whatever is green, it means that it's minimally frustrated, which is the native of that region is statistically more favorable than you could expect 
from random variants. Whatever is red, it will be highly frustrated, which means that the native energy in this particular point is statically less favorable than random variants. So the energy here is not optimized. And whatever is gray, it means that it's neutral. It's not so optimized. It's not so not optimized. It's in the middle. So typically, uh, when uh, my ex-supervisor Diego Ferreira and Peter Wallines developed this algorithm, they found in a, in a big data set that when they calculated the proportions of the residues in each of these categories, roughly 10% of the total were in conflict with the local environment, 50% were neutral, and 40% were minimally frustrated. They were not distributed randomly in the structures, but the minimally frustrating interactions were mostly located in the hydrophobic core, so they provide uh, protein stability. Then the highly frustrated interactions were scattered mostly in the surface of, of, of the, of the um, structures, but they, they were not scattered alone. They were concentrated in this kind of patches, right? Those, like clusters. So this was published, and also they found that uh, highly frustrating interactions, so the red ones here, were also enriched in protein binding, protein protein binding sites, and also in allosteric sites, which is uh, regions in the structures that are mobile in between different conformers that have um, experimental um, structures. And more recently, also we have shown that highly frustrated interactions are enriched around catalytic sites in all the protein enzymes with experimental structure available in the catalytic site atlas. So up to here, I have told you what has been of local frustration in the past. So basically, it has been shown that uh, local frustration is something that happens, is something real in protein structures, and it has been correlated with the occurrence of different functional uh, phenotypical um, characteristics or features like binding sites, allosteric sites, and active sites. But this is a statistical description, which is we take all the protein-protein binding sites and we analyze what happens with the energy, or we do the same with the allosteric sites or the active sites. But the question is, where are they located? Can we compare them between proteins? Why are they functional? So this is the question I started, I started to have in my mind some years ago, and this is what we developed and what I want to tell you about in this in this talk. So the thing is, can we use evolution to better understand frustration? And can we use frustration to better understand protein evolution? So evolution is something that always also interested me a lot. So I, I tried to make a link between function and evolution through local frustration. So the thing is this, let's suppose we have um, a species, right, humans. And we then want to understand the local frustration patterns in a given protein. In this case, it's a globin. So we do the same as always. We calculate local frustration and we classify each of our residues as being part of the minimally frustrated residues, which is good for the energy, neutrals, or highly frustrated residues, which is bad for the energy, right? So if we want to know if this is robust, what we have to do is to compare comparable proteins and comparable proteins in our case is homologous proteins. So what if we just get the same protein in other species? So first, what we're going to do is given the sequence of our protein, we will just transfer the colors to the sequence. So now from the structure, we know that each of the residues that code for this structure, they will get a frustration value from this specific structure, right? And then we can do the same for multiple homologs from multiple species and we can calculate frustration for each of them and then we can transfer the frustration values to each of the sequences that code for each of the structures and then what we're going to have is a multiple sequence frustration alignment where we can easily observe the variability um, in sequence yeah you can see it here but also the variability at the level of frustration so you can see that some columns for example this one here it's always green so it means that evolutionary speaking, uh, you need, or at least these proteins have been selected in such a way that all of them have minimal frustration in this column here, even when the identity can change because here you can, you can exchange between two types of hydrophobic uh, residues. And there are other positions, for example, like this one here or this one here that are consistently read in all the proteins in all the species. 
And if we go back to the, you know, the conflict of protein folding and function, this is very interesting because our logic is if this energetic conflict would be bad or would be undesired, then evolution would have found a way to make it less conflictive, so to stabilize it, right? I mean, and the question is, the reason why this has been maintained in this position all over this evolutionary time, it's because this conflict is functional. So this is our hypothesis, right? So in order to continue to do this, we needed a way to quantify how much conservation we had uh, in terms of energy in each of the columns of this multiple sequence alignment. So we do it in the way as we do it when we analyze uh, sequence logos. Basically, we apply uh, information content, um, information theory uh, concepts. So for each column, in the same way we can do for a sequence logo, we calculate the the, the sequence entropy, so the, the, the or, or the Shannon uh, the Shannon entropy, and we calculate how much conservation we have in each of these columns. For example, here. The taller the letter, the more conserved the lies in, in this particular position in the multiple sequence alignment. The same we do with local frustration. We have the colors in it, the colors distribution in each of these columns, and then applying the same uh, um, equations, we calculate how much conservation we have of the color identity in each of the columns of this multiple sequence alignment. And then you have here the same conservation of the state, the taller the bar, the more conserved the frustration state is. And here, this is green because this is conserved and also green is the, the, the color that is most present in this position in the, in the alignment. So with this, we have now a method to given multiple structures for the same protein family, we can calculate sequence conservation, but also energetics or local frustration conservation, and hopefully try to link the conservation of local frustration with different functional uh, aspects of proteins. So the first um, example that I'm going to show you is the one of beta-lactamases. Why beta-lactamases? Because one of my PhD siblings in, at that moment in the laboratory was working with beta-lactamases and she had a very nice data set of non-redundant protein structures and a very well curated multiple sequence alignment. And remember this work is pre-alpha fold, so it was not that easy to find a protein uh, family with at least 30 members of non-redundant uh, sequences. So beta-lactamases, because it's important as, uh, in the clinical, because its ability to confer um, antibiotics resistance is one of the few families that at the time had enough data to try our method. So we had 31 non-redundant experimental structures and we calculated um, the, 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 the conservation of local frustration at each of the, the, the positions of the multiple sequence alignment. And here with asterisks, I'm showing the presence of the catalytic uh, residues in this family. And you can see that the ones here in red it means that this catalytic residue is highly conserved in its conflicts in the local structure. So not only this one, but also this one here, this one here, and even this one here, that it's neutral when you analyze conservation of energetics at the level of specific protein-protein interactions, like here, you can see that all of the catalytic sites, they are part of a network of highly frustrated interactions, which is they are in an energetic conflict because they need to be in that conflict in order to compensate for the binding of the substrate, which makes the energy better once the complex is formed. But at the time, and we published this, uh, the story is a bit longer, but I have no time to give much more details. But at the time, we found that some residues that are not catalytics, like this one, or this one, or even this one next to the catalytic site here, are also highly frustrated. And we found in literature that these residues are important, for example, for the fast folding phase of the protein, or also to allow the, the protein to um, be able to survive uh, or not to be degraded, actually, um, in, the, in, the, in the presence of antibiotics so fastly. So we start to have the idea that maybe 
this that we observed is not only something that we can apply to um, active sites in protein enzymes, but also something more general that we can use to study protein function. So this is how we, con we continued and we decided to develop a tool because this was a prototype that we used to that specific sample in that paper. But we thought this was worth to keep on developing and that's how we developed the tool that I'm going to show you in a, in a little bit, which is uh, named Frustra Evo, which is using local frustration in the evolutionary context of protein families. And I like history a lot. So the first paper where local the local frustration algorithm was presented was by my PhD supervisor, Diego Ferreira in 2007. And when they presented this algorithm, they applied it for the first time in on a protein that is called EM, IM7. So we were, we were uh, preparing our manuscript. We were like, why don't we analyze the first ever analyzed protein in the context of local frustration? And we see what can we see um, when we add the evolutionary dimension to it. So IM7, it's a very short protein. Well, not so very short, but it's short. It has 87 amino acids. It's a single domain protein that inhibits another uh, protein called colicin E7, that it's a bacterial toxicity um, um, element. And this is a structure that I7 has. And it's known that these two residues here that are important to bind E7 are highly frustrated, right? And when the authors uh, analyzed highly frustration in this protein, they observed that local frustration has the problem that is functional but also it creates problem because when you have something, for example, like these two tyrosines exposed to the solvent, it can make your protein to be risky in terms of being uh, potentially aggregated or misfolded, right? So they observed with molecular dynamics that this frustration here was responsible to the occurrence of an intermediate folding on pathway state in, in the NH landscape of IM7. And that it also uh, led the protein sometimes to misfold. And later on, it was discovered, or it was reported at least, to my knowledge, that the solution that protein had, that evolution has found to make this less problematic is to have a chaperone, actually, that will recognize this highly frustrated region and will bind to this protein, um, avoiding it to be um, toxic, right, to misfold. And this protein is called SPI. It was reported in this, in this uh, paper here in 2018. So this is a general mechanism by which um, evolution avoids local frustration regions to, to be problematic, is to just have a chaperon that binds to it. And then when the correct uh, protein partner is present, um, the chaperon releases the, the, the highly frustrated protein and then allows it to bind the correct protein bar partner, in this case, E7. So, the binding site we observed that really conflicts with the stability unfolding. And, but the thing is that this functional requirement, even when it pushes IM7 to the edge of a misfolding, it's preserved, it's preserved. All over the, uh, the protein family, we, we are going to test this. And evolution has found different um, strategies to avoid the problems here. So this is we created Frustra Evo, and then we applied this to IM7. So we got um, seven homologs for the protein. We fold them with alpha fold two. So these are models. In this time, these are not experimental structures. And we observed what we wanted, which is these two tyrosines here that I said are important to bind E7 are highly frustrated in all the members of the family, right? So cool. We had a hypothesis, and we have proved it. This conflict, even when very detrimental for many things, it's highly conserved because it's very important to have them because it's very important that this protein binds very specifically and, and efficiently uh, its natural cognate uh, protein. But there was something that it was not reported in the original um, work, which is this tryptophan, tryptophan here. This tryptophan here, um, it's all also highly frustrated and conserved in most of the family, except in this one here that has a deletion. So we made some bibliography um, research, and we observed that this amino acid here, actually, it is known to stabilize the protein uh, folding intermediate. So 
this is weird, right? Because we said um, that the protein folding intermediate was a consequence of having this frustration here. But if we have something in conflict in a native state that then stabilizes positively the intermediate state, the question that we pose in the paper is that if could it be possible that the folding intermediate is, itself is actually functional because which would be the reason to have this conflict otherwise here. So we didn't solve, uh, we didn't uh, find the, the answer to this question. We just made the question to show the utility of Frustra Evo to help to understand the function of different residues in proteins, but also to create new hypotheses that maybe were not observed before with the previous frustratometer or other methods in the past. So up to here, I showed how you can use frustration uh, conservation to try to mm, understand uh, residues that might be functional in protein families. But then we had a different idea also. What if we try to understand which are how to compare patterns in between different protein families that are evolutionary related? We could use the differences to understand the specific evolutionary trajectories of different protein families. And this is what we did. So a very interesting um, example is hemoglobin, because as you know, hemoglobin is constituted by two alpha globin uh, units and two beta globin units that form this tetramer structure. Uh, but not only they are part of the same biological unit, but also they are evolutionary related. So they, they descend from the same ancestral protein. So whatever we may find different between alpha and globin, it's a difference that emerged over time after they started to diverge in this point of their phylogenetic history. So we took all the hemoglobins with experimental structures. There were at the time something like 22 proteins, but they were experimental. And we put together all alpha and all beta globins in the same um, experiment. And we observed what was conserved. And this was a little bit disappointing because the only thing that we found is that the only things that are conserved are these green things here and tall, which are basically the hydrophobic core. You can see here a valine or an isoleucine, a leucine. You see hydrophobic uh, residues that make this protein stable. But the question is that, okay, we were mixing alpha and beta globins together. So if we are mixing two functions, then it's going to be masked if you put them together. And then we observe that certain positions like this one here are kind of uh, dichotomic, right? It's either a lysine or either a Q. So it was like, okay, yeah, we are mixing because one of these identities might be alpha and the other might be beta and they are different. So when we split this data set into two, into alpha and beta, then we observe that certain positions uh, start to be conserved and highly frustrated and they are not the same positions in alpha and in beta. In the position that I just mentioned, for example, you have that the lysine actually is specific for alpha globin, whereas the glutamine here is specific for beta. So the question, the, the thing is, if you have followed my logic, is alpha globin has a functional requirement in this position because it has a lysine that is bad for the local energetics, and if this was maintained here over evolutionary time scales, it's because there is a functional requirement. And the same doesn't happen in, in, in the glutamine here in the beta, in the beta unit. So this is all very nice. And we were able to link all these highly frustrated and conserved positions to different functional aspects of, of this family. So we observed that these ones here are all protein-protein interactions, either between the alpha and the beta unit or the alpha and the beta, but just in the other dimer. Or also, for example, uh, we know that alpha globin is toxic when it's alone, when it's a monomer. So these are positions that interact with the chaperone that binds to alpha globin before it's part of the tetramer. And the same happens with beta globin. These positions here are important for protein-protein interactions with the alpha unit. So one question, this was all nice, but I started to be a little bit um, very interested in the question, if I go back one slide. So we know that this position here before, it was the same position, right? So 
I don't know what was first, the lysine or the glutamine in the common ancestor of these two proteins, and which was the original state of the ancestral protein. The ancestral protein was highly frustrated or was minimally frustrated. So what appeared first? So some years ago, there was this paper here, which is amazing, um, which is the, the laboratory of Joseph Thornton here, they studied the origin of complexity in hemoglobin evolution. What they did is that they had, they built a phylogenetic tree and they made um, ancestral reconstruction of the sequences of internal nodes for the ancestor of all beta units and the ancestor for all alpha units and the common ancestor for alpha and beta and the common ancestor of all alpha beta globins and myoglobin. So they uh, uh, express these sequences, they characterize them um, experimentally and the sequences are reported. So we were able to get these sequences, to fold them with alpha fold and to calculate frustration over them and to answer the question of, of what was first. So this is the result because now after this, we also included neuroglobin and myoglobin, which are other subfamilies of the superfamily of globins. And these are the, the identities. So first of all, we know that the ancestral identity was a lysine, so it was the highly frustrated. So these are the, the pseudo time here is how deep in the phylogenetic tree the, the sequence is. So these are more ancestral and these are more recent. And we observed that the original identity was a lysine, so the conflict was present in the ancestor. And then after the divergence, we observed that alpha globins retained the ancestral lysine, whereas beta globins they just changed mostly to glutamines and they became less frustrated. And you can see very interestingly here that neuroglobins and myoglobins who are known to be monomeric, they just decreased completely the, the conflict by replacing the lysine by uh, leucine, which is hydrophobic. So because they are um, monomeric, they don't need an exposed conflict to make problems around. So this was very interesting. But we were not satisfied because these are only three points in the past. So what a student that is working with me, uh, Marco Ludaik, is doing, it's he took the phylogenetic tree and then he used uh, this program to reconstruct the ancestral sequences of all the internal nodes in here. And now we can have a much more resolved um, with a higher resolution uh, of how the, the evolution of this particular residue was over time. So from the most ancestral protein here, which is here, you see that over time you have how in this point neuroglobins and some ancestors of neuroglobins actually started to have a hydrophobic residue. And then here you see the divergence more later in time until we get the diversity we have today in the globins superfamily. So up to here, we have shown how local frustration correlates with different functional um, requirements how local frustration can be understood in terms of phylogenetic diversions if you have a phylogenetic tree on which you can do ancestral sequence reconstruction. But something we are still trying to do is because we have now for each residue in this phylogenetic tree, we know or we have a Gonzalo, you need to mute yourself. Uh, you need to unmute yourself. Did I mute? Was I muted all of the time? So that. Hello. It's only for like, like the, for the past, like. 20 seconds, oh, okay. stuff like that. It's not the best. Oh, okay. So. Okay. okay, okay. So I don't know what happens. So the thing is that um, we now have a resolution over time for how the energetics has changed for every particular residue in the multiple sequence alignment of a given family, in this case, globins. And we want to correlate these trajectories over time, all against all, to know, to better characterize how energetics has evolved from the ancestral proteins to confer specific functions 
to different parts of the phylogenetic tree. I hope this was clear. Um, but for example, if we take again this residue, now that is residue 40, the one I showed before, now what we try to do here is to color the residues according to the uh, frustration state in different parts of the tree. So you can see here that myoglobins and neuroglobins, in most cases here, they became less frustrated. Beta globins are kind of neutral, except for example, this part here, which constitutes uh, um, beta globins that are present in fish. This was very interesting also. Fishes have a different evolutionary pattern. And alpha globins, they retained the highly frustrated identity from the very ancestral protein. So if we correlate off this information from all of the residues, we can start to see um, something like the following, for example. We have here, what I try to do is we can get our, our phylogenetic tree and trace a path that we are interested in. So, for example, we start in the ancestor and we go through the trajectory that goes into the alpha family, or we can go to the trajectory that goes into the beta family. And we calculate how frustration changes for all the ancestors up to the ancestor here. So these are all the positions that are highly frustrated either in alpha or beta globins. And here we can see, for example, here in the top, you have the most ancestral protein and you go up to the present times protein in to when you go upper. The same happens in this, in this uh, beta globin here. And you can observe, for example, that this position here, whenever you see a point, is because there was a change. So the ancestral protein was a T, and then there is a change. In this moment in time, there is a change from a threonine at position 29 by aglutamic acid, right? And here you can see that beta globin actually had an extra change. After this change, then there was this change here and this change here that ultimately ends up being the Q. So you can see that when you take the global picture in alpha and beta, you can see that there are different moments in time when these two proteins have changes. For example, we, we see that the changes are consistent in beta in this position, whereas alpha stays more or less in ancestral states. And then we can compare, for example, all the four superfamilies and observe that um, with, where are the different changes that occurred in every specific superfamily. And now we are trying, this is unpublished work, which is not finished, to make now um, an analysis, a cluster analysis of these networks of changes over time to provide a set of residues that are important for the functional um, identity of the specific subfamilies based on both uh, sequence identities and frustration. Here you have the same, but this is adding just the residues around the, the residues that are important. This is not very important. So up to here, the concluding remarks are that, I hope you, you believe me, that frustration patterns can unveil stability and functional constraints in protein families. At higher levels, superfamily, mostly you recover stability anchors and they are retrieved because functional signals are averaged out. But when you go down to the level of subfamilies, you can get very specific functional signals that emerge as a consequence of each subfamily getting its own identity when you go uh, closer to excellent times. Um, but in the last minutes, I want to tell you where we are trying to go now, also in a parallel work that we are doing with another student from, from our team, uh, Miriam Polay, which is, can we explore, I, I was always uh, amazed by these studies. This is a, paper, a figure from a paper from Alva and Johannes Sodin, where they observe the protein universe by comparing hidden Markov models between all of them, right? And they created what are the things that are more similar to each other in terms of sequence signatures. So I wanted always to understand in these galaxies here, we have a specific fold, right? And why can we get so many families that can be fitted in the same fold? What are the biophysical limits of sequence variation inside of a given protein family fold? So this is the question. Can we explore which is the accessible sequence and structure space at the level of folds and superfolds? So this is the question. And for this, as many other people, we are now fully into 
machine learning methods. We don't develop our methods. We are using methods from other people. In this case, you are using protein MPNN from the group of David Baker. And what we do with this is with protein MPNN, you can get, for example, for our globins, you can get the, the structures and you can run the algorithm. And this algorithm, which is a message passing neural network, this is why this acronym here, what it does basically is to give you a set of sequences that according to a score, they are likely to fold into the structure of your target protein structure, yeah? So we did this with globins and with beta-lactamases. So we generated a lot of sequences with this algorithm that in theory, they will fold in this um, specific structure. We predict the structures of these artificial sequences with ESM fold. We also did it with alpha fold. And we select the one that maximizes the PDT score, which is the, has, the one that has the best quality. Uh, and then we analyze, uh, we make families, right? We make families of these artificial sequences. And then we do our frustration analysis. Basically, we want to know which are the biophysical features of the sequences that this algorithm is uh, generating. So what we found for alpha globins, if you remember, these are natural proteins that I showed before. Remember that the high and red tall bars here are functional positions that are important for protein-protein interactions, salt bridges, and interaction with the heme, for example. We observed that actually when you do protein MPNN, the, the energetic signatures of these energetic sites are buffered out. And this has a, a reason because the, the authors of this paper say that protein MPNN actually might generate sequences that more strongly encode the structures than the original native sequences because evolution in most cases does not optimize for stability. So bingo, they said exactly the same as we were saying before. And now we are converging to a kind of understanding of what's happening. So basically protein MPNN, what it does is to generate sequences that maximize the falling stability of the fold of the target fold. And that's why they are uh, buffering out these positions which are functional, but bad for the local structure. So good. We did the same with our beta lactamases, which is the other example that we like to analyze a lot with all the methods that we develop. And the story now doesn't really make sense because these are the natural proteins. These are the, the catalytic sites, which I showed that some of them are highly frustrated. But the thing is that many of them, they are highly frustrated also in the sequences that protein MPNN is generating. So if local frustration is functional and protein MPNN basically it's maximizing the, the stability gap between the unfolded and the folded state, why are we recovering these positions that are bad for stability, because it's not only the position being highly frustrated, the identity is exactly the same as the native um, protein. So even when locally bad for energy, some of these identities are recovered in a majority of the family member structures when they are used as targets. And the question is why? So I started many years ago to be more and more amazed by an idea, which is that Protein sequences, they cannot explore all the sequence space because actually the laws of physics only allow for a certain number of folds to exist. And perhaps protein sequences, they diffuse in the protein space until they fall in these attractors, which are folds, right? Stable folds. So the question is, can sequence be predefined somehow by the laws of physics ego or, or said in other, time, in other terms, can sequences be predefined by the accessible faults we have in the structural space? Well, this is kind of interesting. It's a little bit um, polemic, but we want to explore it a little bit or to say, because the other alternative is that there is a pro problem with protein MPNN. It's either overtrained or the training data set is biased. So we recover um, sequence signatures that are part of a memorization of the sequence patterns in the in the in the training uh, set so we want to know what is the 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 answer to this question so i will not show you uh, the results because we're working on them just, just leave the question there hopefully i will be able to show the the answer soon but basically frustration analysis 
can help us to interpret what machine lear learning methods are capturing from proteins and A, to improve protein design. So basically, when whenever you generate a set of, of sequences that you want to use, for example, for protein design, we are proposing that our Frustra Evo algorithm can tell you, for example, in your ensemble of artificial sequences, which positions are going to be good for energy or bad for energy. And it can tell you if maybe you are getting some signals that are functional memory leaking from the algorithm. So what? So it's a kind of a method we're proposing. It's a method to evaluate the quality and the, uh, let's say, the viability of the sequences that you can design. And we have the hint that although protein MPN generates minimally frustrated proteins, Sometimes, for example, with catalytic residues, it seems to retrieve the native identities even when they are bad for energy, and we're trying to understand why this is it. So with that, I just want to invite you, if you were interested, to read this paper that we just published uh, late that, uh, last year, where we included many other examples. We made an unsupervised analysis on the entire SARS-CoV-2 virus. Uh, we understood or try to understand based on frustration values why a metamorphic protein changes its conformation. In the case, we studied RFAH. We also studied the superfamily of RAS proteins, and also we uh, uh, correlated our frustration uh, conservation scores with stability scores that are derived from experimental um, procedures like the DPCA by the laboratory of uh, Ben Lerner here at CSG. With that, just to invite you to our web server when where you can easily study your favorite protein family uh, the paper was accepted it's in press i hope it's available soon but you can play around with the web server already uh, this is how it looks it's very easy and then just to thank uh, this is a, a work from quite a few years already and these are all the collaborators diego ferreiro my pc supervisor uh, from many years ago, but we still collaborate. Maria Freiberger, she's the first author of, of most of the evolutionary stuff, Attilio Rauch, and Victoria Serra, and Miriam Pole and Marco Ludaik, who have, uh, have been working with me very closely, and all the other collaborators and the funding uh, sources, of course. And thank you for being here, and I'm very happy to answer questions in case you have one. Thank you, uh, Gonzalo. Uh, let's give a virtual round of applause to him. I think it was very insightful and very interesting. <laughs> and I learned a lot. Oh, we for and as now we are going to the Q and A sessions. So if you have any questions, please drop the question in the chat box, or you can use the what's it called Q and A function. Uh, if you want to ask the questions verbally, you can press the raise button and then you can ask uh, using your voice as well. We already have questions. Uh, there's one from Javier. I'm guessing for the MPNN sequences, the alignment was structure based. Would a sequence aligner be able to align them or are they so different in sequence that sequence approaches could not construct the alignment? Yeah, no. Um, for, so. We are also applying this strategy with other machine learning um, approaches like ProGPT2 and these generative um, algorithms. When you do generative, um, when you use these generative algorithms, you can get proteins. Uh, you know, after fine tuning, you can get proteins from different lengths. So you may need to, you know, readjust your alignment. But in the case of protein MPNN, this is not the case because basically what we do, we take each of these twenty-one proteins and we generate sequences that will fit those protein structures. And in that case, the length of the proteins is the same as the length of the target structure. So basically the multiple sequence alignment is trivial. And so what we observe, and also this is not fair. So in, in, in the work that we are preparing, um, this, we, we took the algorithm here to the limit, to the very, very limit. So we added the most uh, backbone noise, and also we did it with the highest temperature. This becomes better when you use less uh, um, variability, but still you don't get this these highly frustrated um, positions. But no, so um, the, why we did this, for example, is because we wanted to show that when you push the algorithm to the most, you still retrieve 
these positions are important for the protein folding part. So you can get these anchors of the of the stability core, let's say, the, 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 anchor, the structure anchors. But I don't think there's a problem with the multiple sequence alignment. We have checked this and I should have the multiple sequence frustration alignments. If you do that, uh, especially for this case, you would see that the algorithm, uh, the multiple sequence alignment is okay. Thank you. Hey. Oh yeah, that's happier. <laughs> <laughs> so while we're waiting for other questions, let me ask some of it myself then. May I know how fast uh, for us to calculate this uh, local frustration and stuff like that? So um, frustration, mm. oh, this algorithm, what it does, it mm. first it calculates local frustration for each of the protein structures that you have. Mm -hmm. And then given the multiple sequence alignment, it takes the frustration values for each of the structures and calculates the conservation based on frustration of information content. So basically, mm -hmm. the time to calculate is mostly the time to frustrate the data set class. So it depends on the amount of structures you have in your data set and the long, the length of the structure. So basically, for a typical protein family, not so long beyond 400 residues and let's say 50, 70 members, one hour, something, two hours. Oh, that's quite fast then. OK. We could improve it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I hope we can get some interested uh, new students to work on the optimization of the algorithms. Yeah, to speed it out, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> cool. Uh, the next question I have. Uh, so uh, is there any difference if we use uh, PD structures compared to alpha full structures? Or... No, we, we did that actually. Uh, well, I don't have it here. Um, we did this because, you know, um, one of the reasons why I added the, um, the evolutionary dimension is because every, every time I was presenting this work in conferences, people would tell me, uh, and how do you know frustration is not an artifact of the protein structure? For example, even in experimental structures, you can have a clash and this clash will be highly frustrated because the coordinates are not optimized. So I included the evolutionary dimension because my rationale is the following. If I, had, if, if I have 20 experimental structures from different experiments and all of them show frustration in the same position, the multiple sequence alignment, the likelihood for this to have 20 artifacts in different experiments is very low. So the confidence for this conflict for being real is higher. We did the same with models. We got AlphaFold 2 models, ESM Fold 2 models in our experience because also frustration is a coarse grain. So it doesn't care about the um, position of the side chains. It only takes into account the backbone. Uh, I'm pretty confident. As soon as your models are above 80% um, or 70% PLDT score, average, it's OK. Great. Well, of course, it's a case by case scenario. But if you know, if you make models for 20, 30 members of your protein family and they all show this problem here, this this frustration here, you can be quite confident that this is not a you know an artifact. It can be, of course, but likelihood is lower and lower the more members of a family you add. Can I ask a question? Yes. You guys hear me all right, yes? Yes. Yeah. Okay. You just mentioned PLDDT. I was wondering if you've also looked into PAE matrices. That is a error in the we, position. We haven't actually. Um, so we this is something we have to do. So we are now going. So in, in this paper here, uh, where is it? Well, the, 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 the one that we just published, this one here, um, we analyzed five protein families, right? Um, these are families that have a lot of experimental information reported in many, many, many papers or globins, you know, ancient. Um, but there are still a few examples, right? So now we are trying to go um, large scale. So basically, we want to extend this to a representative part of the entire CAF 
database. Uh, and there we are going to have proper statistics of what to expect. Um, we want to know different things. For example, is PLDT score, are lower PLDT scores correlated with high frustration, for example, because we know there is a correlation between PLDT scores and protein disorder, for example, this has been reported. And because local frustration can be assigned to pairwise interactions, it would be also interesting to correlate this with the PI matrices. But this is something we have not done yet. Okay. When you uh, do your frustra frustration evolution analysis for a calf, that will make a nice nature paper. Looking forward to it. I hope some editor is here listening to you. <laughs> <laughs> we have one more question. This is Karen Christoph Feidakis. That was nice. On slide 13, with the homologous, it looks a bit like residues of highly frustration were near or next to residues of low frustration. Is, there, is this a recurring, recurring theme or rather random? Have you tried or would make it sense to consider frustration score in pairs or clusters of residues. Oh yeah, that's so true. Yeah. Let me read it because it's it's. Yeah, read it easier. <laughs> well, this is something we haven't really uh, checked. It would be interesting. Um, yeah, we haven't checked this. Uh, we have made a lot of uh, pair distribution functions, which is this kind of plot here, um, where you check spatially how the distribution of the different frustration states are around certain residues of interest. For example, if you take all binding residues in a, in a data set, you check, um, you see here, you see that there is an enrichment of highly frustration around binding sites. But doing it at the sequence level with pairs and trimers and so on this is something very interesting we haven't done it we offer uh, uh, intern positions for anybody who is interested in doing that <laughs> <laughs> okay i'll ask one more questions what's your future plan for your software or what are the other things you're actually doing yeah uh, to hey. conquer the world. No, um, <laughs> no we, 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 we are very interested now into linking all of this. So first of all, we want to, so my, my dream would be to have um, a picture like this with frustration. So I, I, I would like to understand what are the energetic rules to build particular faults. And once you have a particular fault, how do you put frustration in order to make it functional, right? I mean, this is what in the, in the protein design part, I have a PhD student working in that part. And then the other part is to understand. So for example, I, I really like evolution and you know, evolution um, it's, it's problematic sometimes because it's trade-off between good stuff and bad stuff. Uh, we know, for example, from a recent paper that certain diseases like diabetes or so on, they are the product of evolutionary constraints that, you know, uh, because you have certain ratios that change in the wrong position, then you have a disease. So my question is, are mutations, for example, that are related to protein diseases, uh, falling in conserved regions or not conserved regions? Are they mostly uh, affecting uh, positions that are conserved and highly frustrated, so related to, to, to function, or mostly in highly stable positions, like the minimally frustrated one? Or maybe they are falling in the neutral spectrum, so they shift some sort of equilibrium. This is something, there is another student that started the PhD with us, and it's going to, to make all this analysis in the context of the cosmic database and all these databases that have uh, SNPs uh, that fall into coding regions. So basically my plans for the future are both advancing in, in trying to provide a biophysical interpretation of protein design, because I mean, the advancements in the last 
two, three years have been amazing. Uh, but I think it's still, there is a, still a, a, the lack of a biophysical interpretation of what these um, methods are doing. I think we can help, we can contribute in that dimension and then to link this with the evolutionary uh, dimension in the context of protein diseases. That would be the plan I have for the next years. 